understand this fungal behavior and understand how we can use this information as we face all of these changes in our climate. Now, what you're, these, are, these are symbiotic fungal networks. So what they do is they're exchanging carbon that they get from root systems for fungi, for, for, uh, for phosphorus that the fungi are foraging for in the soil. Now, there's billions of these hyphae under an acre of forest, and there's tens of billions of these hyphae under an acre of grassland. So they are incredibly, incredibly vast. So anywhere between 30 and 50% of the living biomass of these soils is these arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. Now, I think a lot of people don't understand just how much this leads to intense carbon stocks underground. So this is a paper that was in Science in 2019. And it just gives a snapshot of what you're looking at in terms of carbon stocks of tropical rainforests versus tundra underground. So understanding the underground is really paramount to our future. Now here's another tool that we're developing in our lab that allows us to actually make these X-ray 3D scans of the interactions between fungal networks and roots. Now this is really important for all different kinds of domains because when you think about it, it's up to about 80% of the phosphorus in plants is provided by these fungal networks. Now that's exciting because what it means is that the, the DNA that actually makes up our own our, our own DNA, human DNA, is mostly made out of phosphorus that first passed through a fungal network. So what we're trying to do is understand the strategies of these fungal networks, right? Our lab is interested in trying to track resource exchange between plants and fungi, trying to quantify how much of that resources are exchanged, and then predict, right? Predict how these underground flows are going to respond to climate change. And in that sort of looking forward, we're at this really interesting part of biological, I'd say, history, where we're moving from a very old sort of paradigm of microbial behavior as sort of standalone asocial organisms to microbes as social actors, right, performing very complex behaviors. And this is how we're approaching the study of fungal networks. So we're really interested in trying to understand how information across these fungal networks, how it's processed and how it's shared, and how that leads to different strategies across different types of fungal networks. Now, when you think about it, symbiotic fungal networks, they have to do a few different things. And these things are very complicated. So that's why it makes it a really interesting model organism to study. So first, it has to create an infrastructure, right? It has to create an infrastructure to actually go out in the soil and collect resources. Next, it has to evaluate where you would actually transport those resources for trade. And next, it has to collect payment for those resources to get a good price. So again, these are all the types of strategies that we are focused on understanding. Now, the problem is that we've been very focused on looking at fungal networks in a laboratory setting. And what that means is that we don't really understand the context of trade, right? Trade strategies are predicted to shift even if there's just a small change in, let's say, available resources in the soil or you know, how fast a plant may be growing, how much, how much uh, photosynthesis is happening above ground. And bringing up that type of complexity is, is very difficult, right? We don't understand the chemical, the physical, the environmental stimuli that's actually mediating these trade strategies. And so this is my first meme I've ever done in my life. But I, I, I like it because it's really a bit about a poker game, right? So this is what we're trying to understand is this trade for, for carbon to phosphorus. And you've got the plant root on one side and the fungal network on the other. And they've been doing this for 450 million, I get shivers thinking, 450 million years. How could we not be studying the strategies that have evolved, right? And so this is, this is me in the corner just trying to watch. And I would argue that a lot of what's been happening is in the dark, right? In these systems, it's totally underground. So it's very, very hard to understand and track these trade strategies. 
So what we've been trying to do in my group is actually try to visualize trade. And it's, it sounds like a big task, and it is, and sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. But one of the tools that we've been using um, are these in vitro root organ cultures, right? So this is what you're looking at right now. And you're looking at a plant root that has no photosynthetic top, right? This plant root is growing on an agar medium. It gets its carbon from the media and then it converts the carbon into a form that it can feed the fungal network. So what's important about, to know about these networks is that they're called obligate biotrophs, right? It's a big word, but basically it just means that they, they rely on their host plant for all of their carbon, their sugars and their fats. And so we grow it in the, in the lab, in this system, where the fungal network is in this very pristine environment, but it also allows us to have an extraordinary amount of ability to manipulate the situation. And the next sort of technique that we have been working with is, um, is a technology called quantum dots. Now, quantum dots are these semi-conducting nanoparticles, and they, they fluoresce in very pure, bright colors when they're exposed to a UV source. And we can tag those quantum dots onto resources, like apatite, which is a rock form of phosphate. And what this allows us to do is actually then study how resources are moved across the network, because you can use different colors. So right now we've got about three colors that we can work with, and this allows us to sort of change, for example, we can add the different colors at different times, or we can add the colors at different places in space. And then we can first, for the first time, you know, sitting at that poker table, kind of understand the strategies that these fungal networks um, exhibit. And over the years, we found some very interesting strategies, right? And you have to remember, these are all strategies that have existed, right, without cognition, all in the absence of cognition. So we found that fungi are very good at discriminating among plant roots, right? They can tell a plant that's giving them lots of carbon versus one that's giving them very few carbon. We also know that, um, that when you reward fungi with carbon, this triggers more cooperation. So in this case, it, it provides more nitrogen. The fungus ends up giving more nitrogen to the host root. One of the sort of the most interesting ideas is this, this, this hypothesis that fungi can actually restrict the autonomy of root systems. So what that means is that the fungi can get into a root system and actually downregulate the ability of the plant's own nutrient transporters to take up resources from the environment. So basically hijacking the plant's own nutrient uptake system. But that works perfectly for the fungi because then they're, they're getting plenty of carbon and the plant becomes even more dependent on the fungi. fungi can